By the way, I'm David Dumpy, the Executive Director of the Office of Global Perspectives and International Initiatives. So I, I will lecture, I will introduce you, but also ask you to say a little about your own background. And then I think it's probably better in this format with this small group if we just have some open questions. If you want to obviously give some comments, uh, I know uh, uh, politics and education and climate change, that would be appreciated. And uh, we'll, we'll go from there. So should I pick someone with who's eating currently or should I <laughs> wait a minute? Wally hasn't started. Again. You're right, right. So we could we could get her on the environment. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Wally uh, Amira, who is a uh, senior researcher at the Akabongo uh, Research Institute, talk a little about uh, about climate change and her work. Good afternoon, everybody. Again, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm Thank you, David. Uh, my name is Kibakitsu Roshao. I'm um, uh, a senior lecturer in political science at the University of Botswana, uh, where I am also the current head of department of uh, political and administrative studies, uh, one of the original departments uh, of the university. I possess an undergraduate degree in politics from the University of Botswana. I have a master's degree in African studies from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland and a PhD in politics from the University of Newcastle in uh, Australia, New South Wales. My research focuses uh, on African politics. I do also uh, security studies. I am also a student uh, of the ideas of uh, an Italian thinker uh, was called uh, Antonio Gramsci. And uh, of, of late, uh, I've been working on, on some research 
uh, focusing on democratization in the African continent, uh, state institutions, uh, foreign aid, and, and the like. I don't know what I'm forgetting, but uh, for now, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now, uh, last but not least, we'll turn to uh, Dr. Agreement Jokia, who is the uh, acting dean of, under, of undergraduate studies. Graduate studies. All right. Uh, thank you, David. And, uh, thank you, uh, colleagues, for having us. Uh, I initially thought, um, you know, Dr. Lutzwao would go a little bit longer so that I can enjoy my food here. Um, my name is uh, uh, Professor Krimen Jodhia. Um, and uh, my background is in education, having studied at home at uh, the College of Education as a secondary school teacher specializing in English and social studies. And then um, I went to Ohio University where I did my undergraduate. Um, then I did my master's in uh, international affairs with a focus on African politics. And I also did my uh, PhD at Ohio University in educational studies with a focus on uh, democracy and education. I also had a rare opportunity during my studies to teach at uh, Ohio University undergraduates and postgraduate students. Uh, then uh, after that, uh, with the grace of God and uh, the divine intervention thereof, uh, I was invited to UCF in 2007 for a job interview with Professor Ryan. And uh, fortunately, that was the first interview ever after my PhD, which got me a job here at UCF. So I told at UCF for about a year, it was supposed to be five years, and I decided I needed my African roots, and I decided to go back home. From 2007, uh, I continued with uh, Professor Raima in our communication and professional relationship, and we started we started our memorandum of understanding between the University of Botswana and the University of Central Florida. We have done a lot of student exchange programs to study abroad from 2011 up to, I think, 2017, and then COVID came and the rest is history. Um, but then, uh, leaving UCF, I joined the University of Botswana, and uh, as hinted, I'm currently the dean, the acting dean of uh, postgraduate studies. Um, in terms of my area, really, uh, my focus is on democracy and education. And I think uh, for those of you who don't have the background of Botswana and uh, what our education system looks like, just want to make some hints to say, having gained our independence uh, from Britain in 1966, we basically believed that education is the only thing that is going to get us off the colonial yokes and give us the independence that we need as Botswana and as Africans. Um, so our education system was driven by five uh, national principles, which the first president, as uh, the Kama, founded the country on. One was definitely the spirit of development. To say, as Africans and as Botswana, we definitely have to develop our country moving forward. And uh, the second principle was this principle of self-reliance. To say it is only through education that we can become self-reliant, that we can do our own stuff and move forward to shape our destiny in humanity. And the third point was uh, on unity. Definitely, you know that any form of colonialism or intervention of the colonial dictates was never really meant to unite anybody except to disfranchise, you know, the people. So unity became a very fundamental aspect in terms of shaping our education system to say we want people that can, um, you know, unite and move forward. And then the fourth uh, principle was uh, on the principle of democracy. To say it is only through the people's voices that we can build a country 
where everybody comes together to disagree without necessarily disagreeing as much as the king has said. So we have a very powerful system of a democracy where we believe we have to talk, disagree, but still move forward. And then the last one, uh, which I always affiliate uh, it to the operations of the South African democracy, is what we call Buddha, which is humane personality within the South African context, they refer to it as Ubuntu. To say, when you educate an African child from a Botswana's perspective, what kind of a child are you trying to produce? And we are saying we want to produce a child who has a humane personality, they understand the values of their society, and they understand the role that they have to play as responsible citizens within the nation and also beyond the boundaries of the nation as global citizens. So that is basically the nature of uh, our democracy. But then when you ask me about the education system of Botswana, I would say it is tailored such that it advances those five national principles. And those are the principles that we have stood as a country on a solid rock as we shape our path of development. I'll leave the rest to Dr. Lutzwao. He's in political and administrative studies. But as you might be aware, Botswana is the most successful democracy uh, in Africa. And uh, we pride ourselves on that. But our main foundation as to why we are successful is because we believe in the spirit of having to disagree without necessarily becoming disagreeable. Thank you, David. Uh, I don't know what else we need, but I think the more questions we get, uh, the more energized they become, then we can share. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to open it up for a minute, but I want to start certainly by asking uh, you a question, uh, Dr. Rosewell, uh, especially if you've been with your colleagues, if you have a chance to eat. But also, uh, Dr. Drotia just was talking about these founding principles and about the success story of Botswana as a government, um, particularly in comparison to many of your neighbors in Africa. So sticking to principles is one thing, but certainly there have been a lot of challenges along the way. What are some of the other things that have made Botswana's success story compared to others? And I know you've studied a lot of comparative politics as well, so I'd like to hear your opinion on that. Okay, thank you. Um, as uh, my colleague has hinted, uh, you may be aware that uh, Botswana is the longest surviving multi party democracy in the African continent. Uh, in the 1960s, 1970s, it was fashionable for African countries to outlaw multi party politics uh, for one reason or another. All political parties would be outlawed except the ruling party. But Botswana is uh, one of the few countries which never did that. Multi-party system has been in place since independence in 1966. Elections have been held every five years uh, since then to the present day. And we don't see any signs that uh, Botswana's democracy will collapse anytime soon. We think that uh, the democratic system of law will be in place for many years to, uh, to come. And uh, I think uh, there are a number of uh, factors that may have uh, contributed to the survival of uh, multi party uh, democracy in Botswana. Uh, the first, uh, uh, I'll, I'll say, is the, the culture of the people that uh, democracy is ingrained in the people's culture. In the, in the Botswana culture, there is uh, more like in, in, in ancient Greece. We have a system of that is called the Kota system. The Kota is the uh, is the village assembly. That's where the chief uh, who holds uh, central authority within a community resides. The people, the community, would converge there and uh, discuss all issues of importance to the community. Uh, they would make laws. Uh, they will decide public policies. But one of the most important uh, uh, principles of the Kota is uh, free expression, that everyone in attendance is allowed to, uh, to participate. 
Uh, the quota also uh, practices uh, tolerance uh, so that people are able to speak freely, differ, uh, but in a civil and non-violent uh, manner. I think all these principles are part of uh, democracy as we understand it. So therefore, by the time democracy was introduced in Botswana, it was already ingrained in the culture of the people. And that I think did assist uh, people who held political power were fully aware that they had to be accountable. They were holding power on behalf of, of the people. They understood that they had to use that power for national and common good. And this differs uh, from what transpired in, in other Af uh, countries in the African uh, continent. The other uh, factor that may have contributed to Botswana's uh, uh, adherence to democracy is the fact that unlike other African countries, maybe the country was, was lucky enough, its founding leaders, particularly the first and the, uh, the second president, were people who believed in, in, in democratic politics uh, for one reason or another. And if we have founding leaders who believe in democracy, I think uh, you could expect the country to actually maintain uh, democratic politics. And not only that, uh, when the country attained independence, it was among the poorest countries in the world, uh, largely because it was ruled by Britain as a protectorate. Uh, the British had occupied uh, the country in 1885 not necessarily to develop uh, the country, but just for purposes of ensuring that it is not occupied by the Germans. And that was during what is, is often called the scramble for Africa, where European countries were actually uh, dividing Africa amongst themselves as to who is going to rule, who is going to occupy which piece of land. So the Germans were in what is today Namibia, and not far from where the Germans were, they were the Africaners in, in South Africa. But the territory that became Botswana or that became Botswana was actually a link between South Africa and uh, Southern Rhodesia. Uh, Southern Rhodesia later became Zimbabwe. So the British had vast economic interests in the Cape Colony in South Africa and in uh, Southern Rhodesia. But the, the transport corridor that linked the two colonies passed through what became Botswana. So the British occupied Botswana just to protect the road so that the Germans don't close that road in case they occupy the country. Uh, after occupying uh, Botswana, the British did not want to invest in development. They, they actually ruled through what was called indirect rule, where they were allowing the chiefs to uh, rule their people the way they had been, ruling them before the position of uh, protectorate rule. As you could imagine, the British were not doing any development, they were not ready to invest. Therefore, that is why at the time of independence, the country was among the poorest in the world. Education, for instance, had been left entirely to missionaries. Uh, there were no uh, telecommunication networks. There were no health facilities. There were no roads. There were just five kilometers of, of tar road. There were 22 university graduates. And that is how the situation was at the time of independence. But fortunately, the two leaders, the founding presidents that I had talked about, not only were they committed to democracy, they were also committed to development. And one of the things they did was to establish what is often referred to as a developmental state. A developmental state, I think the US was a developmental state at some point. All developed countries were developmental states at some point. A developmental state is a state in which the state or the government play a leading role in the development process of the country, either by initiating development plans 
or implementing them. So they created a developmental stage, and through that developmental stage, the government was able to address the developmental challenges of the people. They were able to build schools uh, from um, low literacy rates. Currently, the country has close to, it has a, a literacy rate of close to 90%. They were able to build uh, health facilities. They were able to construct a physical infrastructure. A lot was achieved, I would say. And that is why Botswana was able to transform from state of upset under development to its current uh, upper middle income country, at least according to the World Bank. Of course, a lot was achieved, but there were other challenges uh, along the, the way. And before I focus on the challenges, I should state that Botswana's development was uh, uh, driven or funded through foreign aid initially, development assistance, and secondly, through diamond revenues. You may be aware that uh, in terms of diamonds, Botswana is the leading producer of diamond by value in the world. Russia is number one by Bolu, but Botswana is number one by, by value. So diamonds, uh, development assistance, have played a key role, a central role, actually, in the creation of uh, Botswana's developmental state. But there are challenges, like I mentioned. One of the challenges that comes to my mind is that uh, as much as development has been achieved, but the process of ensuring that the fruits of economic growth are evenly distributed has not been fair, as indicated by the fact that uh, Botswana is currently among the most unequal countries in the world, alongside Namibia, alongside uh, South Africa, and the like. So I think there is need for, the last time I checked, it had a Gini uh, coefficient or Gini index of uh, 0 0.6, which is not good at all. I think there's more that has to be done in terms of uh, ensuring that the fruits of economic growth are even distributed. The other problem is that the economy is too dependent on diamonds. So it is not diversified. But we know that uh, it's not a good thing to depend on a natural resource whose demand keeps on changing in the international market. Uh, there was almost a problem during the financial crisis when there was uh, no demand for diamonds in the international market. Uh, you can imagine, you probably know what happened to Zambia, you probably know what happened to Chile when the, the, the prices of uh, uh, natural resources like that, the demand changes. So one thing that has to happen, I think, is to try and diversify the economy. Of course, there are policies in place to ensure that the economy is diversified. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Anvira, I think that is what she's working on uh, because there's been a realization that uh, tourism can actually be uh, an important economic sector that uh, can sustain the country uh, once maybe diamonds have been exhausted or there is no demand for, uh, for diamonds in the international uh, markets. Uh, and because the economy is not diversified, there is also a problem of unemployment, especially amongst the youth. You know, you need a, a, an industrialized economy uh, in, for you to be able to generate job opportunities. In the absence of job opportunities, because of the structure of the economy, it's natural that you will have a significant uh, unemployment affecting even uh, university graduates. So job creation is one of the challenges that the country is uh, currently facing. Of course, in the 1990s, the country, like many uh, countries in the region, also faced a problem of HIV AIDS. But even then, I think uh, the government was responsive enough. Uh, Botswana was the first country in the African continent to actually introduce HIV treatment uh, for people affected by HIV and for expectant mothers so that they don't transmit the HIV to unborn babies. And that policy was, I think, a success story. Uh, we know not far from where we were, there were leaders who were uh, 
denial, in denial about HIV AIDS, but in the case of Botswana, uh, government uh, was, was very responsive uh, to the problem and I think a lot was, was achieved. I don't know what I'm, I'm forgetting, but what I can say also is that Botswana is politically the most stable country in the African uh, continent. And we don't see that change changing anytime soon. And the very last thing would be to maybe talk uh, in a minute about the fact that although democracy has been in place, others would argue that, but it's not consolidated in the sense that as much as elections are held, there has not been change of government. We don't know how the ruling party will respond if it is uh, defeated in an election. But we, because of the culture and the fact that democracy has been in place, we expect the ruling party to accept and respect um, uh, the outcome of an election in case they are defeated. Thank you. Thank you. If I go open up for, for questions from, from anyone, I, I, I will follow up. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, right now in Africa, we have um, a new breed of, um, uh, I'll call it new Pan Africanists, who seem to think that all the problems of Africa, like the failure of African development and all of that is because of the West. And they don't seem to hold African leaders accountable for, for this. Uh, that's the first thing. Then the second thing is we have um, this new idea about the fact that democracy um, has not has failed in Africa and that Africa needs a new kind of uh, government that is not really democratic, but an African uh, system of government that is based on uh, our own tradition and culture. So I would like to get your thoughts on that. And thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, I just want to point out that uh, the, the, the issues that you raise are actually have been raised by, by some people, but my observation is that these issues are raised by some political leaders in the African continent. And my take is that I don't think uh, this is genuine. They are raising these issues just for purposes of ensuring that they are not held accountable. They don't want to account, and therefore they have to find an excuse. It's, it's very common, I think, in some countries to blame our own problems on outsiders. And the moment you do that, you see, your eyes are off the board. You are now not dealing with, with your challenges. You are blaming them on another person. Unfortunately, when that happens, you are able to use that to mobilize your political support. Uh, that is what populist leaders are doing. But the reality is that that is done at the expense of the right thing. The right thing, I think, is progress and development for everyone. And until we, perhaps as Africans, come to an understanding that uh, uh, populism is not going to take us any far, not much will be achieved. What perhaps has to happen is, is, is more, I would say, public education, where people come to know about what to expect from leaders, how to hold our leaders accountable, and stuff like that, so that you don't have a leader who keep on shifting posts just to ensure that they, they remain in power, they don't account to, to, to anyone. The issue of, of, of some leaders saying that democracy is foreign is also not a, a new argument. It was tried before I I, I immediately remember in Tanzania under uh, Julius Nyerere, uh, but we know that it was a horrible experience because the moment you say that you don't want uh, a liberal democracy, you don't want multi-party system, 
you are basically saying that you don't want competition. You are saying that you don't want to account. You are saying that you don't want to share power with others. And the moment there's no competition, the moment there is no uh, sharing of power, no accountability, I think our history as Africa uh, would, would show us what happened uh, when uh, there was no accountability, when power centralized. It's actually a recipe for disaster and failure. And that has happened. And I think there are a few instances of countries like Botswana, countries like Mauritius, which have maintained multi party politics. Perhaps we should use those cases to counter the arguments uh, by those arguing that democracy is foreign to us. Ask them how come it's working in some countries, Namibia, South Africa, Botswana, Mauritius. These are some of the few countries that are doing well in terms of multi party politics. There are challenges, there are problems, but I think they are on track. Thank you. I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Gambira a question about development of the tourism industry. And I know a lot of it has been based on Botswana's natural resources. So could you tell us a little about that and, and also how COVID affected that sector? Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, yes, um, as we said before, tourism is very important to Botswana. It is the second um, GDP earner in the country. Um, our tourism is what we term nature based tourism because it is based on the natural resources that uh, the country is endowed with. So you'll maybe you may be aware that our country, almost half of it, close to 40%, it is a um, protected area. So only 60% is left to human settlement. So that goes to show how important natural resources are to us. So tourism is very, very key to, to the economy. We have what we call the um, high, high, high value, low volume, which means that we attract um, a lot of tourists from um, internationally who can pay a lot of money to come see our resources. Um, the reason why it's called high value is because it, it is uh, on the high end. And the reason why it was uh, to develop that way or that policy was adopted was to reduce um, the traffic or to reduce, um, not to turn our, economy, our tourism into uh, mass tourism. So that is the only way that we can preserve our pristine environment. So with COVID, it was a uh, devastation because um, borders were closed. Nobody was moving, travel was halted. So um, bookings were cancelled. Tourists wanted back, they, they wanted to be refunded. So the companies were really had hit. Most of them have not even recovered up to now. Um, they, the people have lost jobs. Um, COVID really, really affected the, the industry in a very, very big way. Um, so even up to now, like I say, some are still struggling to, to recover, even though government has put in place some measures to, to assist in terms of um, remuneration for, for, for staff to try and keep them while they know to what's coming. But it, can, it could only be done for, for a few months. It cannot be forever. So fortunately now the, the borders have opened, but some people are still skeptical. They're still afraid of, 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 of traveling. So we still not have reached the, the volumes that we, we normally that the, the sector would normally survive on. So it was a, a big disaster on, on the sector. Really. Yeah, I have a question actually. <laughs> my colleague who comes from South Africa originally might have something to say. 
Um, it seems that the issue of decoloniality is really coming on strong, and most of what I've read has come from South Africa, particularly for those universities to decolonize the curriculum and how they operate. Uh, so I just like to feel free to <laughs> jump in, but I'd like to. Well, my experience is your university is very British. And I just wonder whether the idea of decoloniality within your education system, and especially your universities, would ever occur. You will leave that for the education institution. Um, probably before getting onto that one, I just wanted to make some observations. Uh, pertaining to the question that was posed by Richard on the issue of uh, uh, African leadership and the, the post uh, shifting to, to blame the Western. Uh, Claude Alke, one of uh, the former Nigerian um, scholars, has made a contention that uh, development in Africa has not failed. The only thing that we know that is that it has not yet started. And then he says power in the African continent was never about the emancipation of the masses, but it's always about accumulation. So, um, and I think to some degree, you know, I'll subscribe to that school of thought to say, you see, our leadership when they resume power is not really about liberating the masses, but what they can get out of it. It's a typically different atmosphere when you look at what is happening in the United States and probably somewhere else, where you have rich folks popping out their monies to finance a certain policy or to finance certain values that they believe on. With us, you are running in for a political position so that you can get something to eat. And the moment you get access to that, you don't want to leave. And that is where I think the whole aspect of you know, African leadership vis-a-vis -vis democracy and development, power and corruption, you know, comes in. And that is why we have all these issues of corruption that are never really getting away in South Africa. I think if you follow South African politics, you know what has happened to the former president, Jacob Zuma, and right now, Cyril Ramaphosa is also on the spotlight. Talk less about Botswana, our former president is currently in South Africa, running away from accusations of corruption and looting and all that. So that would be my subscription, you know, in terms of what uh, your question is about. But then getting onto the issue of decoloniality and education, Karen, I think, uh, uh, as I indicated, uh, Paolo Ferrere, you know, has made a lot of observations in his scholarship to say, we need a pedagogy that is transformative and liberatory and revolutionary pedagogy that is going to elevate the learners from one level of poverty probably to intellectual empowerment that ultimately could liberate them so that they participate properly in the economic development of their country. Within that same vein, I think I would say my response is too strong because you want to decolonize, but at the same time, you don't have what it takes to tailor and support your own education system, which basically means in as much as you want to move away from the yokes of the third party, you don't have what it takes to sustain yourself. So, right, you know, in terms of, you know, South Africa, Africa, obviously, you know, we borrowed a lot from them in terms of the decoloniality and the spirit of Ubuntu and trying to move away from, you know, the, the colonial yokes. And I think you're quite familiar with, you know, the roles must fall, whatever that happened and all that. And as a way of trying really, I mean, of trying to say now it's our time to stand on our own. But more often what we see in our country is that you know, as much as we want to move from that colonial curriculum, you cannot really sustain and maintain your own curriculum. You still have to rely on a book that is written by somebody who is sponsoring you know, the education system. And those of you who are in politics of education and globalization, you definitely know that now we are talking about academia as Olympia, to say we are developing more like some kind of academic Olympics. 
And within the academic Olympics as an African country, definitely you cannot sponsor that. You will have to rely on another college. So the efforts and the attempts, you know, in terms of South Africa, because I know they are really big in terms of the politics of education and decoloniality, is something that we are doing very well, but you still don't have a financial muscle on which you can stand on your own. Thank you very much for that. That was really uh, interesting and enlightening. One of the things I'm really interested in is uh, the use of languages in particularly schools, university, education in general, because the South African government, as you probably know, has just brought in complete changes to their curriculum where they're giving the rights of, of people to be in, uh, educated in their own home language, which of course they're 11 official languages, so it makes it a little difficult. How has that has it carried over into Botswana? And I mean, you know, how what is the whole issue there, particularly of like some of the indigenous languages? All right, uh, thank you so much, uh, Derrickson, for, for that question. Um, let me just sort of take you through some kind of a historic journey in terms of our education system to say we uh, got our independence in 1966. And then in 1977, uh, the first president, together with his counterparts in government, they came up with what we call um, the Education for Kapisano Initiative, where basically they were saying we should, Kapisano means to build or to live together harmoniously. So in 1977, there's a very robust document that talks about the development of the country and the role that education should play. And one of the key issues that came out from that was that the language was going to be very instrumental in the, uh, you know, the teaching aspect, the teaching learning aspect. And I must indicate to you that there were a lot of languages soon after independence that were part and parcel of the curriculum, not what we see today, today having English and Zitorana as the only two media of uh, instruction. And then in 1994, first training, there was also what you call the revised national policy on education, which amongst other things emphasized the fact that mother tongue must become uh, the driving force in the administration of the curriculum. But um, talk now in 2022, we still have not yet seen the use of mother tongue in the implementation of the curriculum. So that is one key aspect that is really, really problematic to say, uh, in as much as Botswana is a multiculturally diverse democracy with more than 26 you know, languages that are spoken in the dialects, talk less about that. You still have Sichuana, which is a language really used for you know, the unification process. Because when you say Sichuana, or Botswana, you're talking about the collective, and then Sitwana is used as a language that is supposed to unify. But the curriculum tells you otherwise. There is what we call, uh, you know, the mainstream uh, society, and then you have the marginalized society. The marginalized society in this aspect, uh, those of you who are abreast with the history of Botswana, you look at people like the Basara or the Sen which are also having their roots in South Africa. Those are people that Sitswana is a language that is being used in the curriculum might be a fifth or a fourth language. So when a kid enters the classroom, they are expected to, you know, you know understand the Sitswana, and that becomes a problem because you have a teacher who is actually not giving a Musara or a San, you know, dishing out the curriculum. So for this student to understand, they have to basically go four languages above before they can get to understand. I've seen the same in the United States. Florida is a very good example of, I think it was the Hispanic population that went to court to say, we cannot allow our kids to be taught in a language that is not theirs. So that is, if you were to talk about some of the challenges of our democracy and education, I would say mother tongue education is one of those real big challenges that from 1977, we have acknowledged the fact that we have to use mother tongue. 1994, 
we made a revision of our education policy and cemented the argument that we need mother tongue in the implementation of the curriculum. But 2022, we are still talking about the importance of implementation of mother tongue. Yesterday, we were at a school in uh, this Stenstrom. Stenstrom Elementary. And I said, um, if there is anything that us as a democracy you know, don't have as a problem is the issue of ideas. We have brilliant people, we have brilliant ideas in terms of what we can do about our education problem. And I said, if there is any American here who thinks they have solutions for our problems in Botswana, especially the education system, I would want to see them because we just want somebody who is a good implementer of ideas. So if you are there, please rise up, you know, so that we can communicate with the powers that be to just help us implement that which we know is ideal to move us forward. So yes, uh, Dr. Erickson, that is a that is a big challenge. Mother tongue is still a challenge, and we always use the example of South Africa to say we have about what thirteen languages in Parliament or so, and we have so many languages in the school. But with us, it's just a problem to get. You know, other languages, you know, embedded within the curriculum. Uh, the other, you know, the so called, you know, the minority or marginalized you know, communities, they've even developed the, uh, what do you call that? Is it the, what do you call it? Is it the photographs? Uh, they have like teaching learning materials in their own languages. But then all they want is that create space and then we'll also avail our own people to teach our kids, you know. You know, in their own languages, and that is a problem. There is one uh, study that is very, very powerful on that area on silent exclusion uh, by Professor Pansiri, where he talks about how language is pushing away some of the marginalized communities from schools because the students or the children cannot understand the language. So they basically are being pushed out of school through language because we have a lot of retention problems in school. We subscribe to universal education, but kids enter school two, three years down the line, they are all out of school because they cannot identify. Thank you. I'd like to say one little thing. <laughs> I'm I understand the value of mother tongue instruction. It makes a lot of sense. But if you're cut off from a world language, and I think historically that was an issue in South Africa that people wanted a world language. If you're only if you only speak Setswana, then you're, you're you have a very small audience. And the, the other issue I saw when we were in uh, in rural schools was that the, the teachers would have to code switch. They were supposed to be teaching in English, but nobody understood. So they would go back and say it in whatever was the popular language. The trouble is the exams are all in English. <laughs> so, you know, it, it sounds like a simple problem until you start thinking about it. And mother tongue sounds like a very good idea. And it's not working in Namibia either because people move around. So a language base doesn't stay in one place. So you go into a classroom and the teacher speaks one language, the kids speak three or four others, and the books are in English. It's a recipe for disaster. <laughs> um, you know, mother tongue makes a lot of sense, but the transition to English or a, another world language seems like if you don't have that, we're cutting people off from any future? What do you think? <laughs> Thank you for the question, Dr. Bin. Actually, uh, I think there's a problem in, in this country, Botswana, Namibia, and South Africa, because the people who are insisting that uh, they should be uh, mother tongue, kids should be taught in their uh, first language and line. These are politicians, a good number of them, uh, uh, elitists, people who are doing very well in their own lives. They are based in the urban areas. At the same time that they are saying that kids in the rural areas should be taught in their language, that own kids are studying international languages, studying French, studying Portuguese, studying Chinese. And these are the languages that actually are going to help uh, these kids uh, as they, they go to 
uh, tertiary education and the like. It's unfortunate in the sense that perhaps uh, many people don't see it this way, but it's just one policy that, in my view, is not going to be very helpful to the uh, kids who are subjected to this. Uh, local languages. Instead, I would prefer a situation where kids do an international language that can help them rather than do a language that is not. We understand uh, uh, the importance of that language, but we're just seeing that how is it going to help this child? Why don't you teach the child a language that will take them elsewhere in, as far as opportunities are concerned? I may be wrong, but that is what I think. Thank you. Uh, let me just add on to that, David. I think there is a misconception or misunderstanding regarding that issue of language. The argument really is that teach English as a subject, right? Each English should be taught as a subject, not really as the language. And that is where the argument is. You know, linguistically, that is where the real issue is. You know, to say, you. You know, for me as a, as a minority, you cannot deny my mother tongue in understanding content, but I still need English as a subject so that as a global citizen, I can be able to communicate with people. So that is the real argument, you know, to say, let us have English as a subject, but we cannot be imposed it as a must do language. Thank you. I think there is an economic dimension to this issue because the people who are advocating for this, they may be coming from minority tribes themselves, but their own kids in the urban areas outside the country are not studying the languages. So they are saying that it's the poor kids in the rural areas who should study these languages, which is, I think, is going to disadvantage them in the long run. That's what I think. Thank you. I have a kind of security environmental question. Um, I've been following the investment by China and Russia into different countries in Africa. And Botswana is uh, involved with China in the Belt and Road Initiative for the development of their infrastructure and businesses. Uh, other countries have done this and the Chinese are not doing this out of altruism. These are these are loans uh, and that when go when they go unpaid, uh, those development projects are repossessed by the Chinese. The port in uh, Djibouti is a prime example, um, and also some of the industries that they're involved in, uh, let's say, are not as uh, environmentally conscious as uh, maybe the public might like. Some of the people are not happy with some of the ways uh, the environment is being treated in their countries. So, um, and, and I hear rumblings, and I say here, I read rumblings of uh, people considering this type, a new type of colonialism by the Chinese government. And I just wanted to get your feelings on that. Um, I'm glad you're here because all I can do is read these things and to hear it from someone that lives there is very valuable to me and what you experience and how, you, how the people feel about it. Okay, thank you. I, I should start off by acknowledging that the Chinese are actually uh, all over. That's why many uh, uh, the Chinese presence is very significant in many African countries, and Botswana is not an exception. Uh, Botswana, like many African countries, uh, did get some loans uh, from the Chinese government. Uh, to construct physical infrastructure like roads, dams, and the like. Uh, but perhaps one of the negative things about these uh, loads is that uh, they are conditional. And one of the conditions is that, uh, uh, which I don't think is a good thing, but many of the construction companies come from China. The Chinese give you money on condition that you employ their company. So you are actually going to be paying the construction company and also repaying the loan. So China has benefited twice, I would say. And uh, do they also import Chinese workers as part of that? 
Yes, there are a lot of Chinese workers. And as a result of that, there's no skills transfer. The local people are just doing uh, menial jobs like uh, labor, do, providing, uh, doing what we call laborers in the, in the construction science. As a result, there's no skills transfer. We don't benefit anything beyond, beyond that. And the other thing is that, uh, you know, China, uh, is foreign policy, one of the principles is non-interference in the affairs of the of, 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 of the, the partner country that is doing business with. So the Chinese have, because of that non-interference, they have given assistance, they have given aid without taking into account the political and governance situation of the country, uh, such that they give money, they don't care whether there's democracy, they don't care whether uh, democracy is respected, whether human rights are respected and like. As a result, you find that uh, somehow the Chinese have contributed to bad governance in the African continent, in the sense that uh, they don't have any problem working with uh, an authoritarian government, they don't have any problem working with the government that violates uh, human rights uh, because they would argue that we don't interfere in the internal affairs of, of the countries we work with. And this is, I would say, unfortunate. But then other people have argued that isn't that what the West was doing at some point? And they have uh, shown instances uh, like Mobutu in Zaire. Uh, in Chile, we know there was a dictator and they didn't have any problem with him. So long as he was saving their interest. So leaders, people, observers have argued that. But what the Chinese are doing is what every outside country is doing. It's only that this is not being said, but it's happening, it's being done by other countries. But the reality is that whether it's done by the Chinese or the Americans or the French or whoever, I think the, Af the African people are the ones who pay the price because they are the ones whose uh, resources are lost through corruption. They are the ones whose rights are violated. They are the ones whose environment is uh, actually being affected by this uh, sometimes level of uh, adherence to the expected um, uh, rules and regulations, environmental uh, 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 problems and the like. So people will be stuck in this in the future and the Chinese will have left. It's unfortunate, but it's happening. Thank you. Thank you. On the issue of um, environment, the country has an environmental assessment law where every big project has to be subjected to an environmental impact assessment prior to its implementation. So, of course, they will do <coughs> environmental impact assessment, produce the report, but when it comes to now monitoring, the competent authority, which is the Department of in some instances, they don't have the capacity to do the environmental audits or even to monitor those projects. Mainly because for each project, they rely on the technical department. If it's a water project, for example, they will rely on the uh, another department to make sure that uh, that project is monitored uh, well. And if it's a road project, just like that, so it will not fall entirely in the Department of Environmental Affairs. So every department also now has its own day-to-day -day operations that they are after. They wouldn't really want to, to, to be they to be deemed as if they are doing another department's uh, uh, duties. But of course, again, apart from the fact that the Department of Environmental Affairs does not have the capacity to do environmental monitoring and monitoring. Also, in some instances, they, they, they will not necessarily approve the project, but now the proponent has got the, the right to ask for a waiver from the minister. So that's another issue that we, 
result in a project that was deemed not to be environmentally sound, uh, it ended up in the proceeding because maybe the opponent has asked for a waiver from the minister. So those are the two activities, either we ask for a, 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 a waiver or there's not enough capacity on the ground to actually see to it that the environmental management plan that accompanied the environmental impact assessment is followed uh, as was uh, proposed. Because remember, environmental assessment is not like, don't, it's not an impediment to, to development, but it is for sustainable development to say, we can build this road, but be mindful of what we can do as you build the road. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question and then we'll wrap up here. What else? Probably, probably wrap up now. Um, I, I, would, would you like to comment on that? Well, I think the reality on the ground is that the Chinese are in charge of our economy. Painful as it sounds. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to thank our, our guests for coming today and thank you for coming today. Thank you so much, David, for having us and uh, thank you for the lunch. <laughs> No such thing as free. <laughs> <laughs>